On August 5th, Missouri voters have both candidates and issues on the ballot. One of the most contentious issues is the vote on Amendment 1, the so-called Right to Farm Amendment. And as the election approaches, the battle for votes is ongoing. If you want to learn more, we have both viewpoints at the table, next on Show Me Ag. Welcome to Show Me Egg. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Thanks for joining us. Amendment 1 has been deemed the Right to Farm Amendment. It's on the August 5th ballot, and lots of folks are making their mind up over the next weeks. It has become controversial, and support for the amendment is anything unanimous, even amongst farmers and ranchers. We're going to offer some clarity on this issue with our proponent, Brent Hayden of Columbia, and an opponent, Wes Schumeyer of Clarence. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Up front, disclosure, I know both of these people very well. Uh, Wes uh, has been a friend of mine for about 20 years and I've known Brent since before he was born because his dad and I have been best friends for a long time. Brent, as a proponent, you are, are for this issue. Tell us why this is an important issue. You know, we've seen uh, efforts around the country in some other states and a lot of them ag heavy states like California and Ohio by uh, pushes from large uh, national animal rights groups to, to outlaw a lot of the practices that are traditional and useful practices in agriculture. Uh, we have serious concerns those same groups are going to come to Missouri. They've already shown a, a propensity to come here, operate in our politics, and spend money, especially with our initiative and petition process. And we think now is the time to get a constitutional level amendment in place that protects farmers and ranchers and the things they do in their operations to keep their businesses viable for the future and in the long term. Wes, you're, you're against this amendment and represent a group that is, is working uh, hard against it. Tell us why. Well, certainly, farmers are, family farmers already enjoy the right to farm in Missouri. Uh, we have it in statute. Uh, certainly, what we're talking about here is not a statutory change, but a constitutional change. Uh, and so, the, it's written so vague that the interpretation is going to come through the court process um, of who's a farmer, who qualifies. And I think we need to lay out in context what's happened in Missouri the last couple of years, Kyle. First, uh, our legislature voted and then overrode the governor's veto to allow foreign corporations to own our farmland. Uh, subsequently, uh, Smithfield Foods was bought out. Uh, 50,000 acres of our farmland is now owned by a Chinese corporation, Shine Wei. And, you know, they have got, they can come in after that, then they become a farmer and go back to the court to say, hey, I know you have a 1% limit on the ownership of land, but we're a farmer. You can't constitutionally limit me and, and limit my rights. So, oh, well, we think it's very dangerous precedent. We think the courts will be crowded and it's so vague, and I think both sides agree it's vague. Uh, we don't think these things should be settled in the courts. I think our legislature and governor found that when issues like Prop B came along, we left, we left them in the process to remedy it, to fix it, to modify it. Uh, there is no modifying the Constitution. Uh, it either it is or it isn't, and things will be determined by a judge. So, Brent, you're, you're a, an attorney. What, why is this a constitutional issue, Missouri constitutional issue? Well, I think it's a con we've, we've looked at this as a constitutional issue for the same reason that you put anything in the Constitution, which is that um, you want to protect the right to do things um, going forward and say something is a fundamental right. And this attaches to what is a fundamental liberty and a fundamental right, the right to raise your own food, the right to raise food for other people, the right to engage in agricultural practices, and one that's got a critical historical history in this, or a historical record in this state. Um, the reason it needs to be constitutional is also because you do want to create a protection just like we have for our speech rights, just like we have for our gun rights. So in the future, if somebody, especially with, in a state like ours that has initiative and petition, an initiative and petition process, if some out-of-state group comes in, runs a petition and throws a lot of money at something in 90 days and runs, you know, runs through some sort of uh, unreasonable regulation or outright prohibition on an agricultural practice, we want to make sure people have their businesses protected. We don't want to see farmers and ranchers in a position where they wake up on the first Wednesday in a November after a statewide election and find out that in 90 days their business model is going to be illegal. And we've seen that happen in other states, and we certainly have the potential to see that happen here. That's what this is about, is protecting those folks. I'll give, give you a chance to respond. Well, I think, I think we're going to have to go back that farmers and family farmers are already protected by right to farm. Heck, I helped put some of them in there. If someone moves out to your farm next to you, they have to put up with your sounds and sights and smells. But I think where the danger comes, we now have to understand that 50,000 acres of Missouri farmland are now owned 
by a Chinese corporation. 27% of the pork produced in this country is owned by a Chinese corporation. Uh, you know, uh, Citizens United says, you know, we, uh, corporations have these rights of free speech and they could consider it a person. I think it's a dangerous precedent if we want to look 20 years down the road and see, because we're going to enshrine this, enshrine this right forever going forward. And agriculture is a very dynamic and changing. And we don't know what the changes in agriculture may be. And so to pass this right on to entities such as that, I think it's very dangerous because if you remember, Kyle, those of us who were around in the 70s remember that that law prohibiting foreign ownership was for a reason. The Japanese had come in, uh, the currency had been manipulated severely, and the, the Chinese are pretty well known currency manipulators. And if you look, that could put every one of our kids and grandkids at a disadvantage in the state of Missouri. And I don't think we ought to put Missouri as a state that's going to allow, uh, just say, hey, we're going to allow this open to everybody. Uh, we need to make sure we take care of those here at home and, uh, you know, and prepare for our future. Go ahead. Well, I think that if you actually read the amendment, the language of this amendment, I think the, the, the scenario that Senator Schumer is bringing up here is a very far-fetched one and one that is not likely to happen. The amendment says nothing about corporate ownership, foreign ownership, doesn't protect any of those things explicitly. It doesn't say who may own, own farmland in the state, and it doesn't say how you can be corporately organized. It does say that farmers and ranchers can engage in farming and ranches, ranching practices. Now, is there somebody, and here's the problem anytime you have a constitutional protection. You can't, you can't guarantee what somebody's going to do in 30 years one way or another. But con the converse is true as well. The opposite is true. You can't guarantee, and in fact, I think we, we, you can't guarantee that they won't, and in fact, they've shown a propensity that they will, for large national animal rights groups, like many of the ones that are funding the, the underlying opposition to this amendment, to come in and pass uh, or attempt to pass laws and regulations that keep farmers and ranchers from operating in this state. And it isn't just in the animal context. We're going to see that in the crop context in the long term as well. What, what kind of groups do you think it's protecting from? What, what specifically do you think farmers are being protected well, from? Our, our largest problem in recent years, both in this state and all over the country for farmers and ranchers, has been the Humane Society of the United States. The Humane Society of the United States is a, uh, a large nationally funded animal rights group. They've sort of become uh, like PETA, except they're a little more respectable. Their guys put on suits, and they, but, and they, but they also raise more money for that reason. They're not out throwing blood on uh, actors on the streets in Hollywood or anything like that. Uh, but, they ha but they are a group that nonetheless is radically anti-meat, that is radically anti-hunting. You see their activities in other states. It, it, it goes to show that. They've, their own executives have come out and said that they want to see an end to the meat, well, the meat eating period and an, and an end to hunting. Um, those are the groups we're afraid of. And the problem we have is that farmers and ranchers in this state, especially on short turnaround where we have initiative and petition uh, campaigns in the state, can't respond to the sort of money that the Humane Society of the United States can throw into a 90-day election. And so we need some kind of backstop in place that creates an automatic standing for a farmer or rancher to say, this is a protected agricultural practice. You can't outlaw my practice on my farm and ranch just because somebody came in and threw a bunch of money and we got, this done, got it done in an initiative and petition election. Well, I think, you know, to go back to the case, whenever things get extreme in Missouri, if it's in statute, which is statutory change is an initiative petition, we need to understand that. The legislature and the governor can get together and modify it. That's what happened. What he's asking us for is a constitutional change. And if you look at the rice growers in southeast Missouri, uh, Monsanto uh, tainted a lot of their, their grain and they had to file suit uh, to get remedy. Uh, and so if you understand that Monsanto probably can't wait to become a farmer in the state, this will pass those rights on to those entities that, that you know, we have to understand that farmers should have rights. And I agree with that. I farm. That's what I do for a living. But neighbors have rights too. And so what this will do is put all the rights on one side of the fence, leaving the other the other person on the other side of the fence unprotected. And I think that's just not the way Missouri would want to do it. Missouri would want to do this in a fair and a fair way to everyone and to our rural communities. And I think you know that we need to understand that uh, changing the Constitution is, is, and I think as we've heard say, we're not sure what this is going to do. The courts will decide that. And I can tell you, I lost one of my uh, one of my most closely held rights, the right to retain my own seat in a court decision, Pioneer versus Monsanto. So don't think that the courts can't take those rights away at some point in the future from you too. I, th I think if that happened, well, I, I again point back to the language of the amendment. If you read the amendment, the amendment makes it clear this is about the rights of farmers and ranchers. These are individuals that engage in farming and ranching to farm and ranch. I think the idea that, and, and we, already have, we already have corporate restrictions on non-family held corporations being engaged in farming. There are exceptions, of course. In, in northern Missouri, there is an exception within the hog farming context. 
but it's in a handful of counties. The vast majority of the state of Missouri, you cannot operate in a corporate form in this state unless you're related to one another within close blood relations. That being the case, I think a lot of this fear about there being this massive corporate conspiracy is overblown. What th th in fact, and those are highly theoretical. What we do know, because we've already seen it happen in this state, we've seen it happen in other states, and we're going to see it happen here again unless we get some protections in place, is that you have, you have large nationally funded groups who want to come in and tell Missouri farmers and ranchers how they have to operate in their operations. And that's what we're trying to protect against. I think a lot, uh, the rest of this is, is highly speculative, first of all, and it's not really based in, uh, for example, there are statutes in place that prohibit every activity that Mr. Schumeyer is talking about. There's a cap on the amount of foreign ownership that you can have. Now, the argument has become this amendment will somehow bust, that foreign, bust the cap on foreign ownership. But that, that takes three degrees of argument. Somebody would have to go and argue to a court that that's some sort of fundamental right that's protected by this amendment. This amendment does not explicitly do this. And I think from every case I've ever seen, it's extremely unlikely, extremely unlikely, that a judge would ever find that. Now, you don't, and to be, to be clear here, you don't write constitutional amendments in any context, in our federal or in our state constitution, because they're not statutes. You don't write them to have every specific contingency covered. When it says that you have the right to bear arms, it doesn't then lay out every firearm that you can own. When it says you have the right to free speech, it doesn't lay out every place you can exercise your right to free, spe to free speech. This is similar to that. It doesn't lay out every single contingency because that's the point of a constitutional amendment. It's supposed to lay in broad protections for, the, for activities like farming and ranching we're trying to do here. But I don't think it goes to the point that, that it will somehow bust the cap on foreign ownership or on corporate ownership in this state. Let me ask a, a question here. There's, uh, there's already a, a lot of regulations, and, and let's face it, I think there needs to be some regulations. I think Missouri citizens would support regulations to, for clean air, clean water, et cetera. So what, are there any current regulations that would not be in place if this amendment passes? There, there, first of all, the amendment does not uh, explicitly throw out any current regulation. And there's always a broad constitutional principle that courts at the federal and the state level um, apply whenever you have a constitutional challenge where they say that all rights, all constitutional rights are subject to reasonable regulation. And then, of course, the fight becomes what is reasonable regulation. But they've said that in every constitutional decision since the beginning of time. I think a court's going to look at current statute and say the statutes that we have in place now are reasonable regulations. I think what we're trying to, what we're trying to get ahead of is something in the future, like we saw with Prop B, which what happened to commercial dog breeders. Um, and, and to be clear, this amendment is not about commercial dog breeders, but it was a great, a great uh, example and a great object lesson in the way out-of-state large animal rights groups operate. Uh, dog breeders woke up on the first Wednesday in November and realized that in, you know, in a few months they're gonna, they were going to be put out of business. Now the legislature and the governor stepped in to, to change that, which Senator Schumacher has pointed out, and he's right. Of course, HSUS and their allies fought that all the way, kicking and screaming, and said it was anti-democratic and wrong that that happened. Uh, but you, you don't, when you, whenever you, put a, you set up a constitutional amendment, you do make it open. The courts will always make current understanding subject to the idea that reasonable regulations are, are okay for constitutional rights. It's unreasonable regulations and outright prohibitions that are problematic. That's what we're trying to stop. I'll give you a chance to respond. I'll sure. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he's making my point for me. Uh, he's gonna, the only ones that are really going to make out good on this is a bunch of attorneys uh, because they're going to be taking these cases to court and handling those cases in court. And when you take something to court and when the challenges are made there, the, the, I served with a Representative Byrd who was a constitutional attorney, and every week he'd come into the Capitol and he'd say, the Constitution trumps all. So all these statutes that we talked about, anything that's on the books, anything uh, could be statutorily challenged by a constitutional challenge that it infringes with their right to do with what on they want. Now, 99% of the family farmers out there, they, well, they will never make this challenge because we're doing those things and those practices that don't hurt and infringe on our neighbors. But it's the bad, it's the bad players that will be making that, that have the resources uh, to do this and crowd our courts. So I think we need to understand that, you know, when you look at this Constitution, uh, constitutional change, the only exemption, the only ones left to regulate agriculture. The, if you do this, the legislature can't modify it. The only ones left in the state to, that can regulate agriculture will be first-class counties with a charter form of government. And that's because Senator Justice out of the Kansas City area put an amendment on there and said that she was wanting to protect her areas. So I think those things with local control uh, and those counties and those areas will have a real challenge in, uh, in, in regulating agriculture as should be in their area. That, that's a follow-up question I wanted to ask. There are a number of counties that have adopted health ordinances. Sure. That, uh, in, in, let's face it, the, they're tr trying to restrict in some way some of the larger confinement animal operations. Right. Would those still be valid? 
I think they would be. This amendment says that any power that's currently accrued to the local governments under Article 6 remains in place. So Article 6 is an article in the Constitution that's, that sets out local powers and local the arrangements of local governments in, in our state constitution. The way this was written, it says any power they have under Article 6 now, they'll have then. Now, can the legislature modify those grants of power? Of course they can, but that was true yesterday before this amendment, and that'll be true tomorrow after this amendment. It doesn't foreclose having a political battle about exactly what those sh should be. What it doesn't do, and I've seen letters that claim this, and I think it's wrong, I just don't think it's, it's accurate. What it does not do is automatically throw out some set of local regulations that local governments have legitimately passed under the current process. If those are there today, then they're going to remain in place, and the amendment makes that clear. Now, if the legislature in the future changes the changes the uh, the grant of power to local local governments for any reason it's not just in this context it's in any context under article 6 then then that can change and there will be a political battle on that but it doesn't change the status of that wherever you were yesterday is where you are tomorrow I, it, it is is it possible yes but it won't be because of this amendment it'll be because of a, a broader political battle about what counties should be able to do so go ahead no i think article 6 is where the state lays out the powers granted to counties but there was an exemption in article 6 article 6 section 5 that exists exempted those first class counties from being subject to this constitutional change. So any of those statu any of those local control issues or county ordinances will certainly be subject to a court challenge because it may infringe with someone's constitutional right. It's a statute. It's a local ordinance. The Constitution trumps all. And I think we need to understand that these are these are things that counties, um, I use one for example, in Rawls County, they, they put a green zone around Mark Twain Lake. It's a water source for 16 counties. Someone wanted to put a lagoon within 900 feet of the drinking water source. They said, hey, we need to put a half a mile buffer zone. Uh, but if that individual wanted to come back and say, hey, you're infringing with what I want to do on my land, it could very well be challenged in court, and then we would be at the, at the, at the court's that's an excellent example, and I'm familiar with that just a little bit, even though I'm on the other end of the state, where uh, they said, no, we need a buffer zone here, so it's a local government right. entity trying to do that. Right. Would that be permissible? I think it's one? absolutely permissible, and I don't think there's a grounds under the, the amendment is written to challenge that. That power was laid out, and, the, and that county executed that, that power under valid powers now assigned under Article 6. Let's say this amendment passes and somebody wants to challenge that. The court will very quickly then look at the language of this amendment and say, it says whatever power is going to the local government under Article 6 are still there. And so that power is still there. And those ca those ca they've now won court cases in several counties on local health ordinances. For better or worse, whether you agree with them or not, that is the law and that's the way it's been. They would take an act of the legislature, which it would take anyway to change that grant of power. I simply disagree with this as a legal analysis. I understand it puts forward a theoretical outcome, but that's going to require action by the legislature one way or another. It doesn't automatically happen the day this passes on August 6th. What about DNR or EPA regulations? Let's say that the DNR decided their drinking water was in danger in a particular area and they said, we're going to, to stop a particular practice that we have been allowing in the past, but we realize now it's causing a drinking water problem. Would that be permissible? I think DNR regulations are complicated because some of those are state-based regulations, but most DNR regulations as enforced are EPA regulations. So the way it works is EPA, has, there's federal law that's set out, EPA is in charge of setting those rules out, or I'm sorry, EPA sets them out, but then allows the local state authority to enforce them. This, our amendment can't deal with, doesn't deal with and can't touch federal regulation one way or another. So if there's federal Clean Water Act issues or Clean Air Act issues that the DNR is enforcing, our amendment doesn't touch that. If, if, and if DNR was foreclosed, the EPA would, we, don't, we really don't want that, DNR would have to bow out and the EPA would come in and do the enforcement instead. So no, I don't think this goes to any of these federal rules that EPA and DNR are enforcing. Now if they had some state regulation that was more restrictive than what the federal government was doing, then it's possible, but we've never had that in Missouri. We've never had a state level restriction that's been more restrictive than the federal level restriction in the air or the water context. There's actually been some discussion about making a, a, a statute that the DNR couldn't be more restrictive than a, sure, I, I but don't know if that's. Uh, sure, but I, don't, I still don't think it would put us in a place where this amendment would then affect their, their federal rulemaking or federal rule imposition uh, in the state of Missouri. It wouldn't affect that issue. Well, yeah, that's right. Federal regulations are not, will not be subject to this. That's absolutely right. This is a state constitutional change, not a federal change. But any of those regulations that may be, may be laid out in the state, whatever they may be, uh, will certainly be able to be challenged in a court of law. I think we just have to go back that uh, it's a constitutional right for someone to farm. I think, you know, so you have to understand that their right is protected constitutionally. Anything statutory, statutorily is challenged, and the Constitution will, tr once again, trump all. 
And I think the Senator lays that out as a negative to this amendment. I think that's a positive to this amendment. Just like we have constitutional level protections for speech rights and gun rights. The fact that, by the way, those lead to messy court battles that involve attorneys and are difficult issues to, to, to solve does not mean that we shouldn't have a Bill of Rights. It's clear that it's, in fact, very important for folks in this part of the country, it's very important to me, that we do have First, Second, Fifth Amendment rights, things that protect us from the government. This is another, this is another protection that fits in that vein. So it doesn't become an argument that it's messy or it's complicated or there will be courts involved to say that a constitutional right, which lays out a fundamental right that protects our farmers and ranchers, suddenly becomes a bad idea. In fact, to me, that is the very benefit of this. It, it, farming and ranching is a constitutional right, or it's a fundamental right, and should be protected as an, an explicit constitutional right. Well, I think, you know, he kind of lays out my case. It, it, it protects me. And then, and then the definition goes, who's going to be me in the end? Is it going to be those bad players, the bad neighbors? And what about on the guy on the other side of the fence? He loses all his protection. So I think we need to understand that we have something happening in this country. The largest owner of beef in this country is a foreign corporation. The largest owner of poultry in this country is a foreign corporation. The largest owner of pork, now in Missouri, a foreign corporation. And this constitutional change can give them the very rights that our family farmers already enjoy. We already have uh, the, the right to farm in Missouri, and, and, and we do not need to put this in the Constitution. It, it's something that before I go there, I want to come back to. If, if we woke up the next morning after Prop B passed, mm -hmm. Would this constitutional amendment pre precluded Prop B from taking effect? I don't, I don't as, it, as, as it specifically goes to Prop B, I think it's a difficult question here because this amendment is designed, is designed to protect farmers and ranchers. I think it's an open question as to whether dog breeders would fit within that traditional definition of farmer and rancher. Um, I certainly think dog breeding in this state was, obviously there were bad actors and those bad actors need to be weeded out. Of course, at the time, we already had plenty of regulations in place and there were a lot of regulations on dog breeders. HSUS and their ideological allies came in and demonized those people rather than portraying the truth. Or they do what many people do in political discourse. They, pick, they cherry pick a few bad apples and a few anecdotal incidents and they portray the whole industry that way or the whole business that way. Um, but as specifically as it goes to dog breeding, I don't know that this is going to apply because dog breeding may fall outside the definition of farm and ranch. I think what's instructive about Prop B, though, is it shows us tactically what these groups are willing to do and how they're willing to go about their business. And they don't care who they put out of business and they don't care who they do it to if they're going to advance their own ideological agenda. And their agenda, let's be clear, because they're on record as saying this, their own executives. Their own executives, their agenda is anti-meat, their agenda is anti-hunting, their agenda is, is opposed to the things that we hold dear in the country in Missouri. And there's a lot of groups out here I think that have made a devil's bargain to work with those groups and that they don't even necessarily disagree. I think a lot of the folks that, a lot of the farmer opposition you hear this amendment are not people who are ideologically inclined to be anti-meat. They don't think it's wrong to eat animals. But the people that they're taking money from and the people they're dealing with do. And their long-term goal, once they've, once they've driven out one sector is they'll come out and drive out another. Their long-term goal, and they because they said it, this isn't speculation, is to make the meeting of eating, uh, eating of meat illegal and make make it expensive first and illegal later. So, would the California egg law, uh, where the layers, would that? Let, uh, uh, we had did a show with uh, Attorney General Coster, where uh, California passed an amendment specifying in a in a period of time down the road that they'd have to give chickens more room to lay eggs right. uh, and so on. Okay, big issue uh, hasn't been determined yet. Would this law stop that from happening? That is the type of law that we would be interested in looking at. Now, every law, this is a lawyer's answer because it's true, every law has specifics and, and unique facts within it that have to be examined. I think, though, the idea is that if you have longstanding agricultural practices, that suddenly some out-of-state group goes, to, goes out and says, we need to outlaw this, that's what's going to be protected, and that's what needs to be protected to provide stability to farmers and ranchers long term. I actually don't think many groups that are on the opposite side of this issue disagree about that idea. I think they're just, by the, I mean, as, as a as a aside. I do think, though, that um, they're misguided in their concern that somehow this amendment is going to create foreign corporate ownership of ag land all over this state. I think that is a an objection that's blown out of proportion. Okay, we just got a minute or so left. So, Wes, I want to give you both a, a few seconds to summarize here. Well, I think it's very clear that family farmers already enjoy the right to farm in this country and in this state. Uh, we need to make sure that these rights are enjoyed by those of us who want to keep on living the way we do. 
to extend these rights and, to foreign corporations, and he can say it's hypothetical, but it's a very real possibility. They've already bought 50,000 acres of our land. They already own 27% of the pork produced in this country. And I guarantee you, they don't care about their community and the people in their towns and cities and our environment like the people that farm next to most every one of us. And so we need to not open this door up. We don't want to take the chance to let this happen. And if you're not sure what it's going to do and if the courts are going to be crowded, you just need to vote no. I think that argument fails to recognize that constitutional protections are, first of all, ingrained in our legal system for a reason. It's important to get constitutional protections for things that fall into the category of fundamental rights. The right to farm, the right to produce food and fiber for everybody's use and for your own use is a fundamental right. It's an important right. It's a right that we've had since prehistory, and now some groups want to take away from us. I think that, so to look at that and say that suddenly somehow because there's, it's going to go to court or because it's going to be a complicated set of issues is an argument against voting for this amendment is ridiculous. If that was true, that'd be an, that would be an argument against voting for every amendment that's in our Bill of Rights. And most of those we hold dear and are very important to us within our legal system. I think also if the, if the whole concern here is that somehow foreign entities are going to take over Missouri, American agriculture, it's completely overblown in Missouri because we have a cap on how much land they can own that's going to remain in place even after this amendment. With that said, if you really are concerned that foreign corporations are going to come in, you need to protect Missouri agriculture from regulation one way or the other. Because you'll see what happened in the manufacturing sector and other sectors of our economy is when you overregulate them, that is when that, those, those sectors of industry flee to other countries and end up being in other countries. If you want to see uh, agriculture turn into our manufacturing sector, go ahead and regulate it, go ahead and overregulate it, and you'll see it's going to end up in China and Brazil like our other sectors of our economy have. Well, I'm afraid that's a spirited discussion, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have tonight. I'd like to say thanks again to Wes Schumeyer and to Brent Hayden for being with us tonight. And we'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Ag. We hope you'll tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at KMOS and myself, good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeag at camos.org or find us on Facebook. 